Hello, and welcome back to Children's Reading Cove. This is Chapter 11 of My Side of the Mountain by Jean Craighead George, in which Frightful learns her ABCs. Free time was spent scraping the fur off the deer hide to get it ready for tanning. This much I knew. In order to tan hide, it has to be steeped in tannic acid. There is tannic acid in the woods in oak trees, but it took me several weeks to figure out how to get it. You need a lot of oak chips in water. Water and oak give off tannic acid. My problem was not oak or water, but getting a vessel big enough to put the deer hide in. Coming home from the stream one night, I had an inspiration. It had showered the day before, and as Frightful and I passed an old stump, I noticed that it had collected the rain. A stump, an oak stump, would be perfect, I said right out loud to that pretty bird. So I felled an oak over by the gorge, burned a hole in it, carried water to it, and put my deer skin in it. I let it steep, oh, maybe five days before I took it out and dried it. It dried stiff as a board, and I had to chew, rub, jump on it, and twist it to get it soft. When this was done, however, I had my door. I hung it on pegs inside my entrance, and because it was bigger than it had to be, I would cut off pieces now and then when I needed them. I cut off two thin strips to make jesses or leg straps for frightful. All good falcons wear jesses and leashes so they can be tethered for their training. I smoked the meat I couldn't eat and stored it. I used everything I could on that animal. I even used one of its bones for a spearhead. I was tired of catching frogs by the jump and miss system. I made two sharp points and strapped them to the end of a long stick, one on each side, to make a kind of fork. It worked beautifully. Frogs were one of my favorite meals, and I found I could fix them many ways. However, I got to like frog soup fixed in this way. Clean, skin, and boil until tender. Add wild onions, also water lily buds, and wild carrots. Thicken with acorn flour. Serve in turtle shell. By now, my two pairs of pants were threadbare and my three sweaters were frayed. I dreamed of a deerskin suit and watched my herd with clothes in mind. The deer for my suit did not come easily. I rigged up a figure four trap under the log and baited it with elderberries rolled into a ball. That just mushed up and didn't work. Then I remembered that deer like salt. I made a ball of hickory salt with turtle fat to hold it together. Every evening, Frightful and I, sometimes accompanied by the barren weasel, would go to the edge of the meadow and look toward the aspen grove to see if the great log had fallen. One night, we saw three deer standing around it quietly, reaching toward the smell of salt. At that moment, the baron jumped at my pant leg, but got my ankle with an awful nip. I guess I had grown some. My pants and socks did not meet any more. I screamed, and the deer fled. I chased the baron home. I had the uneasy feeling that he was laughing as he darted, flipped, buckled, and disappeared. The baron was hard to understand. What did he want from me? 
Occasionally, I left him bites of turtle or venison, and although he smelled the offerings, he never ate them. The catbird would get them. Most animals stick around if you feed them, but the baron did not eat anything, yet he seemed to like me. Gradually, it occurred to me that he didn't have a mate or a family. Could he be a lonely bachelor, taking up with odd company for lack of an ordinary life? Well, whatever. The Baron liked me for what I was, and I appreciated that. He was a personable little fellow. Every day I worked to train Frightful. It was a long process. I would put her on her stump with a long leash and step back a few feet with some meat in my hand. Then I would whistle. The whistle was supposed to eventually to mean food to her. So I would whistle, show her the meat, and after many false flaps, she would finally fly to my hand. I would pet her and feed her. She could fly fairly well, so now I made sure that she never ate unless she flew to my fist. One day at breakfast, I whistled for Frightful. I had no food. She wasn't even hungry. But she came to me anyway. I was thrilled. She had learned a whistle meant come. I looked into her steely eyes that morning and thought I saw a gentle recognition. She puffed up her feathers as she sat on my hand. I call this a feather word. It means she is content. Now, each day, I stepped farther and farther away from Frightful to make her fly greater and greater distances. One day, she flew a good 50 feet, and we packed up and went gathering seeds, bark, and tubers to celebrate. I used my oldest sweater for gathering things. It was not very convenient, and each time I filled it, I mentally designed bigger and better pockets on my dear hide suit to be. The summer was wonderful. There was food in abundance, and I gathered it most of the morning and stored it away in the afternoon. I could now see that my niches were not going to be big enough for the amount of food I would need for the winter. So I began burning out another tree. When the hickory nuts, walnuts, and acorns appeared, I was going to need a bin. You'd be surprised what a pile of nuts it takes to make one turtle shell full of nut meats. And not a snapping turtle shell either, just a box turtle shell. With the easy living of the summer also came a threat. Hikers and vacationers were in the woods, and more than once I pulled inside my tree, closed my deer flap door, and hid while bouncing noisy people crossed the meadow on their way to the gorge. Apparently, the gorge was, was a site for those who wanted four-mile hike up the mountain. One morning, I heard a group arriving. I whistled for frightful She came promptly. We dove into the tree. It was dark inside the tree with the flap closed, and I realized that I needed a candle. I planned a lamp of a turtle shell with a deer hide wick, and as I was cutting off a piece of hide, I heard a shrill scream. The voices of the hikers became louder. I wondered if one of them had fallen into the gorge. Then I said to Frightful, That was no cry of a human, pretty bird. I'll bet you a rabbit for dinner that our deer trap worked. And here we are stored in a tree like a nut and unable to claim our prize. We waited and waited until I couldn't be patient anymore. And I was about to put my head out the door when a man's voice said, Look at these trees. A woman spoke, Harold! They're huge. How old do you think they are? Three hundred years old, maybe four hundred, said Harold. They tramped around, 
actually sat on the baron's boulder and were apparently going to have lunch when things began to happen out there and I almost gave myself away with hysterics. Harold, what's the matter with that weasel? It's running all over this rock. A scream, a scuttering and scraping of boots on the rocks. He's mad. That, that was the woman. Watch it, Grace. He's coming at your feet. They ran. By this time, I had my hand over my mouth to keep back the laughter. I snorted and choked, but they never heard me. They were in the meadow, right, run right out of the forest by that fiery barren weasel. I still laugh when I think of it. It was not until dark that Frightful and I got to the deer. A beauty it was. The rest of June was spent smoking it, tanning it, and finally starting on my deer skin suit. I made a bone needle, cut out the pants by ripping up one pair of old city pants for a pattern. I saved my city pants and burned them bit by bit to make charred cloth for the flint and steel.